So my name is Keith Klobeck. I'm an assistant state conservationist uh, for programs in St. Paul with NRCS. I want to start off by just welcoming you and thanking you for joining us today for session two of the local ed conservation training series. Um, the focus today is going to be on making your local work working groups informed. This builds on session one where we covered making your local working groups matter. And we all know there's a lot of information out there in the form of science, tools, processes, and other people to help us inform local led decisions. Today, you're gonna to hear from SWCD, NRCS, and partner staff as they share experience, their experiences and insight on some of the technical and science related items that are available and how they can inform your local working groups. So please keep in mind, uh, NRCS, we have the requirements to evaluate a large range of resource concerns on many land uses. This often exceeds the scope uh, and focus of some of the other plans, such as One Watershed One Plans and the other local plans you all are familiar with. So a few of these additional needs that we need to assess include energy use, air quality, livestock, production limitations, weather resiliency, and for these reasons, uh, we're not able just to replace our local working group process with these other plans and uh, the information that they have gathered. So that's always, that's been one of the topics that's brought up. Why are we duplicating these efforts? What are we doing additional? And that's some of the information that we'll cover today. So I ask that you be an active participant today in the chat to some of you are right away, thank you. And the breakout rooms and all the interactions, uh, just as we need input and engagement to make the locally led process succeed. Today, we need your input and engagement to make this training a success for everyone that's in attendance. So again, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being here. And I will turn it over to Leanne Buck with MASWCD. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, welcome everybody. Again, I'm Leanne Buck with the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. And it is an honor and a privilege to partner with NRCS on this training opportunity. And also for me, it's learning from each other as we continue to enhance our natural resources and our mission of private lands conservation. So as Keith had mentioned, you know, this is the second out of our four webinars in this series of advanced and locally led conservation. And so as you kind of think about it, what I wanted to uh, kind of bring to the forefront is in an age of managing data and information, um, I know, at least for me at times, it can be a bit daunting, not only to use the appropriate information, but to stay current as well as communicating the desired outcomes uh, as it relates to priorities for local resources, whether it's at your, even for your board of directors, for those of you that have supervisors on your board, again, uh, in the one watershed, one planning process, the local work group process, et cetera. So today, I just really want to emphasize that the 90 minutes that we'll be looking at is we're going to be learning from each other as we continue to build upon your already great work. And again, it's incorporating the best science. And we're also going to be at the same time acknowledging as resource professionals. I also want to acknowledge you know, your expertise, or as I like to say, your own applied science to make informed decisions about the local resource concerns and ultimately the strategy to leverage both SWCD and NRCS programs in your communities. And your community could be your field office, your district, your uh, sub watershed, your major watershed, et cetera. But again, ultimately then trying to take that science, that information, while also then at the same time trying to break it down and ultimately communicating priorities to the public. As um, some leaders and mentors that I've said, you know, words matter. And so again, as we articulate the science, the information and the wisdom that you have, while at the same time gathering the public's input is obviously very key in whatever we do. So I just wanna say again, thank you for your role and sharing your expertise as we collectively advance our private lands mission. And so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Donna Ray Shefford and Lisa Hines, again, additional partners that we're continuing to work with. And it's a pleasure to work with everybody here today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Keith and Leanne, for those opening comments. I wanted to share what our agenda for today will look like briefly and refer you to your pre-packet that you should have received by email. So the other um, interactivity we're doing and on your notes page is we're asking 
for people to name their um, favorite high school subjects. And we'd like to know yours too in the chat. So I want to go back to Keith. Keith, what uh, comes to mind as a favorite high school subject? Mine was biology. We had Bill Banky. His nickname was Bio Bill, and he just brought it home for biology to me, starting in high school and continuing on. Great. And how about Leanne? So for me, I think the unique one was uh, I had Mr. Bolin, and in junior high, it was uh, Southwest Minnesota history. So you can learn a lot in the the public texts about statewide history, but it's always fun to know a little bit of history of where you come. Thank you. Great. And I think mine was we had three instructors at Little Falls High School. So they were really specialized. And I really like the, the family consumer science, the financial management side of the house for a class. So um, thank you. I wanted to give a broad opening to uh, what we're doing today, just to put it in context for the series. So if we can go to the next slide, Lisa. Um, Three-legged stool, we had one of these in my farmhouse. And so thinking about what we're doing with science, um, this is a visual that we shared during the um, locally led Conservation One series that we'd like to share again. And so you see there are three feeders. In a moment, we'll see there's three feeders into this idea of what are the priorities. So we're Today, looking at the blue and the teal, looking at the science, the information, the studies, the plans, but also aware that whatever you have in progress or that you're positioned to go, or maybe you've accomplished some goals and, and made significant progress. Those are the two aspects we're dealing with on this webinar series two. Um, number three next week is gonna be more on the human side, getting interests and so on although we touch on that slightly today. And so with that, I want to um, hand it off to Lisa Hines. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Ray. So I'm gonna quickly do our Zoom room tour because I know that's a good basic anywhere. Um, and I've mentioned that my favorite high school classes were uh, two of my faves were music and math, although Heather reminded me that I love French too. I kind of like school. So sorry, Eric, lunch was not my favorite topic. All right, so with that uh, quick, Reminder that we do use the chat here in the Zoom in our uh, Zoom experience, and so please feel free to use that. We're going to prompt you a couple of times to share your examples and ideas. Um, and of course, you may know, but if you don't already, you can send messages to everyone. You can also send messages to individuals by clicking on that everyone button and picking the name of the person that you want to visit with or connect with. Um, you can check your hearing, I'm assuming, because I haven't gotten any messages that, uh, that the sound is working just fine, but you can always test it using that up arrow next to it. And then last of all, um, generally you're gonna be on mute, but we will have breakout rooms again this week and we'll invite you to unmute when you get in there so that you can hear each other and have a conversation, all right? So with that then, I wanna kick us off first by asking how, what you use to inform your local work group participants. You know, we've all got things that we do to inform folks when they're coming to the table, as it were, or bring in their stool, Donna Ray. Um, and I'm actually going to launch a poll here. Let me get my, my slide to go forward and invite you to share what you use. And if you have that, if there's something else that you use, we'll invite you to put that in the pot, in the chat pod as well. So what are the things that you use to inform your local work group participants? You just go ahead and do the poll. People are starting to jump in. All right. And of course, if maybe you don't run a local work group, but you contribute to it, um, you are certainly welcome to name what you recall or have seen in the local work group as well. And thank you, Keith. Yes, if you don't see the poll right on your screen, there's a poll icon at the bottom of your screen. Thank you, appreciate that. And folks are jumping in pretty quickly and we will share the results with you because it's much more interesting if you do something like that to, uh, to actually see what happens rather than wonder. And we've got a little bit of a pause here. Uh, so I think I'm gonna end the poll. Oh, somebody else is jumping in. Give just another second and three, two, one. Let's see what those results are. 
Okay, so last year's report, that's the far and away, the most used item. The summary next up, or excuse me, the uh, one watershed, one plan, ah, which we probably wouldn't have seen on this list about 10 years ago. So um, some examples of what, what you're currently using. And then of course, we're gonna go a little deeper as we go on today. With that then, let me just close our, uh, close our item. And I want to invite um, Ryan Galbraith to join us from NRCS. And I believe, and Ryan's actually gonna share his screen. So I'm gonna stop here and invite Ryan to share his. All right, hey, welcome Ryan. Hey, hey, good afternoon everybody. Thank you for and, joining us in the- And what's your favorite high school class? Oh, I almost, um, uh, outdoor education. I went to a larger high school and we had a class called outdoor education. Uh, we got to do things like cross-country skiing, rock climbing, canoeing uh, on the, uh, it was really, really awesome class. And I think it kind of helped me to, uh, you know, appreciate my love for the outdoors greater and, and look at my profession today where I get to help the outdoors and do conservation all the time. What a, what an awesome opportunity. Uh, so I, I give a lot of credit back to, to my outdoor education instructor who I can't remember what her name was. So <laughs> she did a great job teaching us the content. So. Um, excellent. So let's, I need to close the poll here. So what we put together uh, is uh, just this document here, which helps to kind of provide some, some, some sources, if you want to call it, for uh, data, right? Where some information you can gather and use to inform your local work groups to help them make decisions when you're developing your priorities. It's not an all-encompassing list, but there's quite a few things in here that can help with you know, putting together just like an executive uh, a page or a few pages of your, of your action plans to help inform your local worker participants of some of the things that occur in your own name. You know, some things that you may want to consider, like how much of a, a specific land use do you have? How much of, of a certain type of ag do you shape your prioritizations? So what we'll do is we will, um, we will go through the list that we, we put together here. So we have these uh, NRCS uh, resource concern fact sheets. Uh, we've had these in the past. These have been updated. So when the resource concerns in 2020 were updated, these fact sheets were updated. But these are a very, uh, I'm going to say a, a very um, user-friendly, um, plain language written fact sheets on resource concerns. And then Keith mentioned about all these resource concerns and prioritizing. Uh, but, but what these do is they help to describe what the resource concerns are, um, some common common uh, causes or things that can cause these resource concerns, and then some things that you can do to help fix those. Um, very useful when you're trying to explain what resource concerns are to folks that aren't in the, the conservation business day in and day out. Uh, we, have, we also have a spreadsheet. Uh, the resource concern fact sheets can be found in the field office tech guide section three. Also in field office tech guide section three is the list of resource concerns in their categories. So there's a spreadsheet that's pretty easy to follow too. So you can find out which categories, which resource concerns go to, what categories they fall under for SWAPA. Uh, nice, nice spreadsheet listed in the field office tech guide. Conservation practice standards too, if that's something that you wanna focus on at your local work groups, uh, those are located in the field office tech guide section four. Uh, and then we also have the land use definitions, and that's in the National Planning Procedure Handbook. But this comes in handy when you're trying to describe what cropland is, what forest land is, uh, what associated ag land is, if that's, if that's something that you want to focus on. Uh, so the land use definitions that we use, and we tie those to our programs uh, for some of the fun pools too, uh, those are in the National Planning Procedure Handbook. Uh, that National Planning Procedure Handbook can be found on e-directives. Uh, and if you don't know where e-directives are, just ask your local NRCS office and they'll get you to the right location. There's a lot of existing plans already that we can use that have all this data that you're probably looking for. Uh, we have the SWCD annual reports that have data specific to your counties. Uh, those are typically located on that Soil and Water Conservation District website, that county website. The county comprehensive plans have a lot of data too. Uh, these have information on demographics, urban expansion, uh, rivers, systems, all these things. Each, each, each comprehensive plan may be a little different, uh, but what an excellent source to get some information 
uh, that, that may be current. We also have uh, the, the local water plans too. Those local water plans have some strategies that were put in place. I think they're updated every five years. Uh, there's reports that go to them, but here's another place where you can garner information to put together to help drive decisions at that local work group. One watershed, one plan. I'm not going to go into specifics. We have folks that are going to talk about that, but that's another great source where they've used some, some modeling to figure out where the prioritizations could be, should be in certain watersheds. Uh, source water protection is another area. Um, you know, you, you could have a source water protection plan for one of your drinking water supply management areas, source water areas within your county or areas. Uh, and that may be something that you want to pull into to, to play when you start talking to your local work groups about prioritization. Uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency also has a lot of information on their websites about um, all the different watersheds, um, the, in, uh, the, sorry, the impaired watersheds also, RAPT reports, someone's going to talk about those here in a little bit too. Uh, and that there's a link to the wraps in here as well. So lots of information. Uh, land use data, the Minnesota Natural Resources Atlas. Uh, there was a, a Bowser Tech Talk this last Monday. You can go in and view the recording for it, but it shows you how to use this atlas. This atlas has a lot of reports that you can also use and generate to show your local work groups where certain things are. I think there's a feedlot map, there's map on nutrients spreading restrictions, there's all these different things that you can get and reports you can generate to help drive some of that information or data, to get the data to drive the discussions at your local work groups. Uh, the Minnesota Geospatial Commons is another area that if you have GIS capabilities that you can get layers and all these things to, to generate maps and to generate information. Ag data. Uh, NAS, National Agriculture Statistics, has a, a plethora of data on your county, uh, on your on the state itself too, and you can go in and you can generate reports from the census. Uh, this may be important when you're talking, you know, to, to help guide your group on which sectors of ag are the biggest in your area. You may be the number one pork producing county in the state, and that's something that you may want to bring forward to your local work group. Uh, uh, dairy, uh, beef cattle, livestock industry, acres of corn grown, typical farm sizes, number of farms in your counties. Uh, it's, it's pretty good data when we're talking about conservation and who our, our, our typical clients are. Uh, and this, that's all information that you can get pretty readily for your county specific information through NAS. Other data, the Minnesota State Demographic Center has information on populations, on age, sex, race, and, and origins. Uh, great information if you have urban trends that you want to talk about or you know, if there's urban expansion, all these things. So uh, the demographics of your county may influence how you prioritize your, 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 uh, prioritize your priorities in your, your local plans. Um, Emerging Farmers Report in Minnesota has information on beginning farmers and historically underserved farmers also. Uh, very, very powerful if that's something that you're going to prioritize and target. Invasive species, another thing that if you have invasive species, uh, the DNR has an excellent website for those. Uh, also threatened and endangered species is another category too. If, you, if that's a focus that you wanna have, uh, there's information on threatened and endangered species. Uh, DNR also has some state species of concerns that you could pull to. Uh, scenic and natural areas, another, another great source. And then there's a few other ones listed. Um, I don't want to say this is the only source for information. These are the only sources for information. You know, you also want to get some local information too, and identify some of those priorities. Identify maybe some um, some emerging trends, uh, what, what what have you. But this is data that your local work group is going to need to make those decisions when it comes time to prioritization. The more you can frame, the more you can paint the picture of the current status of your county, your local areas, the better that this local work group can prioritize or, or make those recommendations when you're putting together your, your conservation action plan, you know, your prioritization. And that helps drive like what you want for your outcomes, like Leanne mentioned. You know, that's, that's huge, right? So uh, these, these are excellent sources. I'm sure you all have a whole lot more sources handy and readily available at your local level. Uh, but here's the things that, that we put together to, to help you to get on your way. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we will send this fact sheet out 
and we are seeking in the chat links to other resources or, or your opinions, some that you found especially useful. And also it, um, it occurs to me that with other meetings and planning, that sometimes by the time you get to the local work group, it's a matter of summarizing because you can cut and paste from some data you found for some other purpose. So um, thank you very much. We, um, thanks to Ryan, are, are warmed up on the wealth of databases and resources. And it's my opportunity to add another uh, factor, which is also the, the number of plans that are out there. And the key question or what we're really curious to learn from you is how do you uh, align these plans? Because it's still your district, it's the same natural resources setting, and yet it's different agencies that are asking for different types of plans. And so um, with that, so we are gonna start with the poll. And um, Lisa's opened that up. If you're not seeing it on your screen, it took me a minute earlier too. just hover over what says polls and it should pop up on your screen. But have you informed your one watershed, one plan if you're doing those with your local work group report or vice versa, take your local work group report and bring it to your one watershed, one plan. Or if you are using the comp plan or the SWCD plan, um, do you bring that to your local work group? or do you bring your local work group in when you're refreshing or do, new, doing a new iteration of your comp plan? People are uh, weighing in, slow but sure. Looks like for now the, the no bar is um, coming and we did do a survey in the fall and one of the key findings from that survey about locally led conservation and local work groups was kind of the ambiguity or confusion about how to align these various planning processes and so on. And so I think the, it's not a surprise that we're seeing this many no's, but it's one reason why it's on the seminar series today is to think this through a little bit on how would you or might you do this. And so um, we see we have the first one, the one watershed, one plan with your local work group about 52% say, nope, haven't done that yet. Or if you're using the comp plan, about 55%. And so again, it's not a, um, it's a curiosity and it is a question for everyone to figure out with all these incoming plans, how do you make that alignment to streamline or make sense of your priorities? So with that, I am delighted to um, introduce our next speaker. Greg Johnson from MPCA. And you do have a handout in your handout set. And Lisa will bring up some slides to share. But first of all, Greg, can you tell us what your favorite high school subject was? Yes, I can. Um, I actually, as I thought about it, was like, there's different subjects that were favorite for different reasons. But my overall was as with many of you, um, was biology. Okay, thank you. So Lisa, if you want to forward the slide and Greg, you can um, help us um, try to make a mapping or a sense of these, all these things that are um, forces impacting planning and implementation in Minnesota. Okay, thank you. So just uh, Start out, um, this, this slide is a compilation of effort uh, by uh, Marcel Lewandowski at the U, Matt Drewitz with Bowser, and Shannon Carpenter with NRCS. So I thank them and then others for reviewing it. You'll find out uh, this uh, is definitely not um, in the end, a a slide for presentation in a PowerPoint. But I do encourage you uh, in the handout to look at it. If you have questions, um, there's any number of people that uh, can help you um, or direct you to where, um, to a person that can provide more information. 
planning encompasses uh, many needs and purposes, uh, but we sometimes intermix those needs and purposes. And yes, sometimes it seems like all we do is plan. Watershed planning is no different. Um, there's been various diagrams and descriptions of water planning in Minnesota. And those descriptions and the approaches have evolved over the years. Um, today, I'm just going to walk through this slide that breaks, uh, as I said, all the rules of presentation, but uh, Lisa was kind enough to break it into chunks uh, for a little bit easier um, walkthrough. So next slide. So watershed planning in Minnesota really crosses geographic scales from the statewide programs and strategies uh, to the major watersheds um, with the uh, smorgasbord of acronyms you see here um, to more detailed assessments and plans at uh, smaller watershed scales and on down to uh, the individual landowner and BMP design plans that uh, many of you may be most familiar with. Next slide. And so the, the planning processes, you know, from, from state down to the site uh, um, are often very similar, um, but the level of detail generally increases you know, from state level down to site scale. Uh, the Minnesota Water Management Framework, as you see in this slide, uh, really serves as a foundation for Minnesota's uh, approach to water planning, especially, you know, from the state agencies, um, MPCA, Bowser, uh, Department of Ag, DNR, Health Department and then on down to uh, the SWCDs, which I think a lot of you are with. Um, the NRCS area-wide planning is uh, a parallel approach uh, for NRCS programs. Um, I'm not able to say a whole lot about that, um, but talk to your NRCS people. Um, and then, uh, the small watershed planning documents and guidance um, are being incorporated more and more in the small scale HUC 12 uh, watershed planning. Uh, the real key uh, in all of these as has been discussed already and, and you're very familiar with is that stakeholder engagement and partnership development you know, among agencies, among citizens, between um, groups is very important. Uh, next slide. And then you get this myriad of tools that are available for developing and implementing the plans. Uh, the tools will vary from field measurements and monitoring uh, to simple to complex models. There's qualitative to quantitative tools, there's manuals, there's um, BMP design tools. Um, I'm not gonna go into any one of those. Um, and again, there, you know, various agency resources that can um, provide more information. But uh, again, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna come back to the most important tool in my mind is the connection and that you have and the relationships that are built with landowners because it's the land, it's the landowners where, you know, uh, work actually gets done. And so next slide. So combining each of these individual pieces uh, gives you a glimpse of the many watershed planning efforts that are occurring in the state. And it also provides a, a visual of the complexity of connecting the pieces across 
you know, the federal, state, and local landscapes. Um, that is all I have. Well, thank you, Greg. It reminds me, and I just want to say, we know that folks involved in this series uh, are right in the middle of that. I was a country girl when I go to the Twin Cities. It's one of the big malls. I always loved that. I am here. So I knew when I got into one of those big places how to navigate. So this is a, a navigational system. <laughs> but we recognize that each of you are um, in, in the mix of this. So thank you, Greg. We're going to move to um, Darren Newville. And Darren is going to hone in on his district and how he used the um, alignment method. So welcome, Darren, and your favorite high school class or one of them. Um, I really enjoyed all of the science classes. Uh, a couple that, that really stick out to me is we had a natural resource and wildlife management class. Um, and then we also had a vocational wing where we had some ag science classes and uh, the plant and animal processing class that I took was kind of fun because we got to do fun experiments like uh, grilling 70% lean ground beef and 90% lean ground beef and making the same size hamburgers and weighing them before we grilled them and after we grilled them, but before we put the cheese on them. So it was kind of fun doing that kind of stuff. So as we, you know, when we were taking a look at this, um, I, one of the things that I really think about is, you know, Funding from any source is really a key to address any of our local priorities. Um, and the federal USDA funds can have a big impact. Um, so I think that anything that we can do to help direct those funds to our local priorities is really important. Uh, I just remember a couple of years ago, we had some uh, local work group trainings. I don't even remember how long ago that was, but it was a few years ago. And I really came away with that, with the, with the concept that somehow we needed to link any type of our planning efforts, whether that be our water plans um, or the, the one watershed one plans that we have right now to NRCS resource concerns. We needed to try to speak the same language, uh, so to say. Um, if anybody's gone through, most of us have gone through the uh, local work group planning um, efforts. And we know that NRCS has this really big spreadsheet that has four land use categories, the cropland, farmstead, pasture and forest lands. And then a whole bunch of uh, land um, resource concerns underneath that 50 or something like that. Um, so when we were going through uh, our one watershed, one plan planning process for the red eye watershed, um, of course, like everybody else, we use multiple groups to help do that, whether it's the policy team, the technical team, and then the citizen advisory team, um, which is exactly what NRCS wants us to use for input for these local work group meetings. Um, so I think that it's really good that, that we use that, those special interests, whether it be lake associations or ag groups or realtors or whoever, um, to get that uh, through, through surveys or however we take that. Um, and I think that it's really important that we use that and, and try to link those up somehow. So when we were doing the process for the Red Eye Watershed, um, one of the concepts that we came up with is let's make sure that we use the language that they have. And as you guys can see, we have this, uh, this is a page right from that water plan that shows you what our uh, top resource issues are. These are our tier one issues for that watershed. Um, it, it has our issue statement that, that we came up with, and then it connects it directly with an NRCS resource concern. And then we went even further, and I think a lot of people are doing this now where you're doing planning regions, and it shows us exactly where it's important that we work on that so that we can direct that right to that. Um, so the, the language is right in our plan. It's really easy for us to take this, this page out of our plan, take it to the local work group meeting with any other um, information that we need to help get that conversation started um, and bringing all that uh, into that so that we can do that. And, and again, recognizing the role that if we can get USDA fundings to help support our local priorities in any way, shape or form, we're gonna be able to get to our goals faster um, and accomplish a little bit more by using the funds together. Um, again, it's just a, a really easy way for us to make that process get started. Great, thank you, Darren. And we will, um put a link to the entire report in your follow-up materials, and you should have this in your pre-packet that was sent out. So 
Um, one question for you, Darren, did you share the NRCS language with your group members or how did you kind of make the translation and um, kind of the two different language sets? We did, uh, we brought in the previous year's information from our local work groups um, and shared that with that technical advisory team um, as we were moving through to make sure that we were linking things up correctly. So I think that that was important sharing that information back and forth. And can you say a bit about using a shared language when different um, groups come with a different vocabulary? I, I think that that's pretty, a pretty sound concept that I think that we all speak a different language. I know that in, in my professional world, um, I'm using acronyms like one, you know, one W1P or WACA or things like that. And I go to, you know, talk to my family and they all just look at me like, what are you talking about? Um, so it's, it's one of those things that I think that it's really important that we try to do that. Um, I think a lot of our citizens groups don't, I mean, water quality degradation, excess nutrients in the groundwater, do they really know what that means? Um, so I think that we need to be able to uh, bring that to their level um, when we're doing that. That communication piece is, is really, really important. Um, so that's, I, I, again, I think it's important that we try to connect those in some way, shape or form. Well, thank you very much. And we are inviting in the chat, anybody who has other examples, how they've aligned it. And one thing I really like about this is how you're taking it in people's own words. I'm worried about drinking water, but then you put some of the issue statement, but then you make a translation, if you will, to NRCS so that it's a seamless, um, that kind of meets everybody where they're at with their words but then um, it's a multi-use plan. So thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna end this section and I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa to introduce our next section. Sure, and I see there are a couple of comments in the chat pod about the value of this sheet, Darren. I, I don't know if you're looking at the chat, but I just really wanna uh, let you know it's appreciated. And we, we are gonna share the whole plan. It's the, at least the link to the whole plan for folks who wanna see how this particular uh, chart is contexted in the larger One Watershed, One Plan, or 1W1P if I'm going shorthand, Darren. <laughs> I at least know that even if I'm not in your household. All right, well with that then, we are going to move into a conversation with, uh, with Justin Hansen from the Maurer SWCD. And uh, before we get to that, Justin, um, as I give you some co-hosting rights, we wanna make sure you can do that. Um, I want to know what your favorite class was in high school. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, good to see a bunch of people I haven't haven't seen much of for a while. So this is pretty fun. Um, you know, I think I I think I said this morning the that the ag class was my favorite class, and and I really did enjoy um, the welding part of that. It was it stretched me out a little bit, taught me some new. Um, some new skills. As I was thinking about it, though, in the meantime, it probably had a little bit more to do with the girl that I was interested in at the time. And, and, uh, yeah. Oh, you did so not share that this myself. morning. <laughs> yeah, my first, my first answer was probably a better answer. The second answer is probably more truthful. But... Well, thanks a lot, um, everybody for, um, making some time to do this. Uh, I, I took a peek quick at the um, at the list of folks that are, are involved in the call and, and there's nothing I'm gonna talk about today that's gonna be brand new news to anybody that's that's on this call. Everybody that I, I recognize has got a lot of experience you know, coordinating, engaging, sharing good science with uh, with their um, with their constituents, boards people you work with. So, um, but I will say this whole exercise just of putting these thoughts together um, about, about these local work groups has, has kind of stirred me up a little bit and challenged me to think about how our local work group um, is gonna be set up in the next month. And, and it's kind of challenged me to think back on, on some of these, uh, some of these experiences I've had where it's went really well, sharing science and and um, and and integrating that in with with our work. So um, maybe if nothing else, we just get 
get people excited about about local work groups again, right? Um, all right, so districts are are pretty amazing in that you know we were we were formed out of a out of a very strong need, right, for for conservation delivery systems and. In a lot of ways, we've maintained so many of, of the aspects of, of that work over the years. You know, we're still identifying resource concerns. It takes an individual um, effort to, to engage with our, our cooperators and, and find um, solutions. Uh, that, that part hasn't changed too much, but it has evolved a little bit. And, and um, you know, the we have, changed around the ways and means that we we do our work and the purpose of our work. Um, I think one one thing that maybe gets overlooked a little bit is that, you know, we're, we're going through a paradigm shift in in the way that that SWCDs do our work, at least, and that, you know, we're, it used to be that we would service a, a resource concern on an individual, uh, land, with an individual landowner, maybe it involved several landowners, but a lot of our work was just identifying and, and fixing one resource concern. Now, we're going out and doing more of a community uh, type engagement project where you might be implementing, asking somebody to implement projects that don't just uh, address the concern on your property, but, but maybe have more benefit to your watershed uh, community. And that's a different dynamic. That's a different conversation. That's a different level of trust. It, it's, it's different. And I, and I think, you know, for those of us that do uh, the local um uh, conservation delivery, the one watershed, one plan. We've we've experienced that um, that that challenge. So um, when we're talking with our groups, th these resource concerns that we've all experienced are easy enough um, to identify and, and talk about, right? People uh, and and calling them out in meetings, I think, is important as well, because we we get flood amnesia as as in in this photo here. Um, but we also recognize that that individual landowners you know connect with what happens on their farm right these uh they've experienced you know the dirty water they know that there's runoff that there's ponding in this field um they understand those connection points um what they have more trouble with is understanding when we get into graphics like this now this is a very powerful uh uh illustration, right, for, for folks. I mean, this tells me a lot. This is, right, calls out the fact that in our really high flows, we're getting the greatest amount of, of runoff. Um, but, you know, there's utility to us for this, but but kind of limited utility for, for maybe um, some of the folks in our audience. Another example is, is, is this graph, right? We're looking at, okay, how are we doing in relationship to our water quality standards? And very useful tool for us because we're seeing how those different dynamics uh, float around. But it just it becomes overwhelming when you get in the wrong setting. And you guys have all been in a meeting before where you get overwhelmed or if you feel dumb for even a second, you check out and move on to something where you don't feel so dumb. So uh, just trying to make sure that we're we're keeping um, keeping the engagement piece in mind as, as we go forward, because with all of these tools, and we present these tools and, and we gotta be really careful with how we push those out a little bit because people can get overwhelmed and then they and then they shut down. I think we've all we've all kind of been there. So when I think about uh, the most meaningful um, and important outcomes that that we get out of most of our meetings, they come back to that um, that engagement piece and being intentional with engagement, like. Um, you know, there, there is, there's a meeting purpose, right? There, there is something that we need out of some of these meetings. We need input, you know, but, you know, the way that you get to that end result is going to take some level of engagement a lot of times. And that means you kind of got to let, let go of the wheel and let, let the group guide you. And, um, and, and when you can do that successfully, that's, that's when I've had, the best experience with with meetings and so along those lines i, I kind of look at this a little bit like a football um a strategy you know when you get to game day you don't want to be practicing right you don't want to be putting in your game plan on game day you want to be um you want to be executing and a lot of for us we practice every day we talk about resource concerns we talk about water quality issues and, and 
But most of the folks that come and participate in our meetings have other things that they're practicing every day. So going back to what Darren was talking about earlier, you know, that, that communication piece is, is just so important, getting it into, you know, formats that they understand. And it's so that when they show up at the meeting, they can play fast. Um, and to do that, we, you know, sometimes you need to just get your, get what your outcomes are. What do you, what do you want out of that meeting? What do you call a win? Sometimes you have to focus your execution. Um, I read once that the Green Bay Packers of the 1960s, they won a couple Super Bowls because they, they executed at an elite level. They basically ran six plays. And within those six plays, they generally ran two plays all the time, but they ran them to perfection. And they knew what they were, and and they knew how to how to execute. And um, it's it's something I try to challenge myself with a little bit is, you know, how much how much is too much, and and what what is enough, you know, execution that's going to be needed to be to be successful. The feedback comes to us in in so many ways, and and when we go to a meeting, it's kind of like opening up a box of chocolates a little bit, right? Like force gum. You don't know what you're going to get. You might get um, a meeting dynamic full of people that are are highly informed on the topics we're talking about. Um, but a lot of times we get we get all kinds of different folks who have different ways of of communicating their interests and their their needs and, and outcomes and goals. And so I think the challenge for me and for us is to try to take that input and integrate that into the science. So, um, you know, we're not teaching necessarily our local work group day or in our, our engagement meetings, but we're um, communicating, engaging, going back and forth uh, on, on what those needs are. And then, and then the, the responsibility, we've asked them to come be part of our meeting and to give us something. I think the least that we can do is help them um, be successful in that effort, in that that input that they give back to us. So, you know, an example of that, you know, to think about without making this too overly complicated is your farms are very personal, right? So if we get a farmer uh, in particular with our uh, local work group meetings, you know, they might provide input and it may not be as part of the meeting, right? The, the formal part of a meeting, I've found a lot of times you get, you either get a uh, a punchline or you get an answer that they think you want to hear. Uh, but sometimes if, if you can create kind of a safe space or you just hear them talking on the side, you might get a comment like my dad put in grass waterways, you know, I believe in these buffer strips because they protect, you know, this creek that we've been fishing in for years. And then you like the CRP because uh, it gets, it gets some habitat. I mean, you can very easily take that story and get that into the resource concerns of, of sheet and rail erosion and, and take, um, talk about the water protection aspects, the pollinators, the habitat, and, and take what they said and just put it into our words and, and help them understand that, that this is how these pieces are connected. And then um, that validation piece is so important too, right? Like if you, you take that input and then you speak that back out. I guess, you know, it occurs to me too, I was after this morning, I was on Nate Hilla's uh, presentation last week. So people facilitating meetings have very different styles, right? Nate's probably throwing a party. There's people all over the place, right? And you're playing games and activities, you know, and, and I think like Adam King would, would recognize he's part of my one watershed work group. My facilitation process is to listen. I mean, it's very calm, laid back, right? And then, and then I like to do that. I like to, okay, I'm going to validate what you just said, make sure I heard it correctly, get it recorded and just move methodically. So I would say that there's probably not, you just need to be, just get to the finish line, right? However, it works best for you and your group. Um, so we, we like to highlight uh, the success stories. This is um, such a great uh, visual here. I mean, recognizing farmers, this is a, our Dobbins Creek project where we went up into the, the headwaters in the specific neighborhood and worked with individuals on, on a number of practices. And I mean, it's unbelievable how they came through, right? And so to recognize those efforts and how that's connected to a resource concern on their farm, but also 
um, how you're helping the rest of the community. And now we can kind of bring it back. So if we start consolidating all this data and information, I find that it's kind of useful to talk about big, big picture, right? We have a big picture goal. This is kind of the geography. This is who's involved. And then, um, but when our, our, our stakeholders are in the room, they want to they still want that personal connection. So bringing it back to a dot, right? Those can be kind of important because what do those dots mean and, and how close are they to my, my land or, or somebody else's property that, that, um, that I know about. So kind of taking it, bringing it all together with a mixture of, of big picture, uh, short-term um, goals. So temperature check on a, on a meeting. Um, are these um, engagement meetings or am I lecturing? Right. And am I, are they going to leave the meeting energized or bogged down? And one thing I always do, uh, try not to do, right. Don't, don't measure the success of a meeting by the amount of people there. Let's, let's think about it in terms of, um, of who, of the, of the input and engagement that we've had. So very quickly until Donna Ray cuts me off, I'm going to show this video that we put together just as kind of an illustration. It's really easy to um, summarize a lot of work and a lot of good effort and a lot of science into a very short video that, I mean, it, this one's three minutes long and there's a ton of information that's kind of baked into this, you know, and the music kind of picks up and, and you know, uh, comes to a, a certain uh, high point and, and it just, it, it breaks things up rather than just having the, the discussion. It, it gives you something that you can kind of sit back and, and consume. These are very easy to do. It takes just minutes. The, the software is out there. So take a look at this stuff and, um, and reach out to us if you have questions. And we'd be happy to help you with that. Thanks, everybody. Keep up the good work. It's good to see you guys. All right. Thank you. And Donna Ray, to you. Yes, thank you, Justin, and we'll put the link to that video. So now it's your turn um, to talk with your colleagues. We're going into small breakout rooms, and what we're suggesting as the topic is how do you share scientific information as part of this planning conversation? And we'll put that in the chat, too, once you get there. So a couple tips. One, unmute yourself. To start by introducing yourself very briefly and maybe just geography where you do your work. And then one person we'd like to raise their hand and just say, I'll keep a couple notes because we'd like to have one or two tips afterward from each small group. So if somebody can volunteer, you'll have nine to 10 minutes in your breakout group and you will get this sign of a one minute countdown but just finish your thoughts and then you will be automatically rejoined here. So um, also some of you will get an invitation to join your meeting room, click yes, and you will go and because meet your colleagues. Else. So great question. So great question. We are ready to go to breakout. And welcome back. All right. So we wanna see what uh, tips you have to share and we hope each group has one person to share those. And um, Lisa is going to start us here in a minute. We're going to use an online Google tool called Jamboard. Uh, there is a, a time limit and a, a number limit to how many people can be in the Jamboard at the same time. So if you're that volunteer group reporter, we'd like you to click on the link that Lisa posts here in the chat. And then the rest of us can um, watch what happens on our shared screen. So if you, with Google Drive, you would find the Jamboard. Mine, I had to scroll down to find it after learning about it from Lisa. So take it away, Lisa, on um, Jamboard for us. Great, yeah, well, thank you, thank you. And I see folks are already joining, reporters are joining. And if you weren't, I do know some folks were not able to join their small groups. And uh, yeah, I hope there were good conversations nonetheless. Um, I'm gonna give a quick, uh, quick how-to here of how to use the Jamboard. Um, if you look over, those of you who are in the Jamboard, others can watch, um, go to the left side, you'll see four down, there's a sticky note, I'm clicking on it right now, you'll get, you can change colors, but you can type your best tips in there, I'd encourage you to put one tip per sticky note, and then you save it, and it posts up on the screen, 
then I'm going to encourage you to move that to another place on the board because we'll get a big pile of sticky notes. They all go to the same spot. So as you look to put your chips on the screen, there we go. Um, feel free to, uh, to, po to write and post. And again, one tip per, um, per sticky note, just like real life. This is real life, right? We're, we're in real life right now. Um, and one thing I mentioned when we did this this morning, I mentioned this as well, which is um, if you want to be more specific, that's great. You know, we can do, um, you know, some folks put videos. That's great, right? We want the reminder or the refresher because some of you are very experienced. And just having this conversation today, whether it's hearing Justin or Darren or Ryan or Greg, you start going, oh, yeah, I forgot I could do that or whatever the case may be. So there's that part about just kind of the headline. And if you can go a little deeper, if there's specifics you heard in your conversation um, that, uh, that you think, oh, you know, here's a really good idea. Somebody this morning made a point about making ideas relatable, like vehicle maintenance on your car as a local working group is like vehicle maintenance. Um, those metaphors or those specifics can be a really good way to remind people of uh, some ideas about how to share that scientific converse, share that scientific information um, and a refresher for those of you who are, thank you, Don Ray, um, who have been around for a while. And if, for instance, you, uh, you weren't able to join a small group because you got called away or something, do feel free to jump into the Jamboard um, and add a tip if you see it. I know we got some very experienced people on here. And as Donna Ray said, if you don't see a tip on there that you want to add and you don't know how to join the Jamboard or it's not working for you, please go ahead and put it in the chat pod and I will arrange this. And you'll get a copy of this Jamboard later along with the Jamboard from this morning. We had about twice as many people on the Jam this morning. So that board got very full of things. Um, so feel free to put it in the chat pod as well. As we wrap up, I do want to appreciate uh, something that Justin said. I didn't get a chance to share it, but uh, he talked about that role of the facilitator to translate and to you know listen and and paraphrase back, and um, that different facilitators have different styles. I just really appreciate that uh, reminder, Justin, that each of us has a way that we might approach things, and the skills can still play out even if they play out with a different uh, a different look to them. So thank you for that. All right, and we're getting lots of lots of stickies on the board and even different colored ones as well. Well, I'm gonna invite folks to continue to add to the Jamboard if they choose. Um, if you're in there already, it won't go away. And what I'm gonna do then is bring us back to our meeting group as a whole um, and actually pass to Donna Ray um, while I put up the slides for our next piece. And good to see some faces. Hi, Adam King, I see you. Well, hello again, and we are moving into our final content section here, which includes two of our, our guests. Um, the first part is brought to us by Corey Walker from NRCS in Alexandria on developing a conservation needs assessment. And then the second part is Keith with a return role on action plans. So with that, we are going to um, welcome Corey ask him his favorite subject in high school for your notes and for our entertainment. And then we will um, kick into the, the slide and key, key messages. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, my favorite high school subject um, would be math. Um, I see there's a bunch of my staff online. I'll be testing you later on that. So we'll have some fun, fun with that. We got to try to make this a, a fun and process because uh, I'll, I'll kind of lead off with, uh, you know, developing a, my section here on developing a conservation needs assessment. Um, if you don't, it can be a lot of what you put into it. If it's a lot of, if you don't put much time into it, you're not going to probably get a lot out of the local work group prop meeting itself. Um, like uh, Justin had said, just a minute, listening, listening is a big key. Um, letting people talk, do their, do their part of it to feel like it's just not being run over by people that are saying agency acronyms and different things um, that can help a lot. So um, go ahead and go to the next slide. 
All right. So what is the conservation needs assessment? Really, this is probably one of the first steps, uh, like a meat process of the whole problem of the whole local work group. Um, it, it's what kind of helps you form where you've been and what you're going to do. Um, so it, it's just kind of a baseline to get the get the conversation started. Next, please. All right, this is for the policy readers out there that uh, wanna see where this is coming from. This is not just made up, uh, NRCS 440 manual, conservation needs assessment. I'm not gonna read that. Uh, you can, uh, con comprehensive analysis of the work. It's like, it's where you've been, kind of a plan uh, assessment. You know, we gotta have public input that's in the manual. Uh, it's not just gonna be, we're gonna make decisions on a high spot somewhere and make it work. Uh, it's got to have the public input, and that can be um, us and the, the really our, we want um, customer involvement is really what it is. So go ahead next. NRCS roles. NRCS does have a role in this whole thing. It's not just let it back and sit there and watch the partners do it. We have to be involved as NRCS, aiding, helping, get some numbers put together. It's not like you got to be careful. We're not sharing all kinds of data and breaking any laws that way, but you're talking more on natural resource inventories and the resource concerns as a whole and, and being part of that local work group process. Next. Uh, this is gonna be some of my take on this per se with the conservation needs assessment. Take your time prior to local work group, do your homework. Uh, programs usually come, will always come up it seems because People like to talk about how much am I going to get paid? How much is this going to pay? But the local work group process should be resource concern driven. Talk about areas in the county, resource concerns. Use different types of reports. NRCS, we have ProTracks. It's um, not too hard to pull some reports for the past year, few years. SWCD reports exist. We've all talked about this the last two weeks. Existing inventories, one watershed, one plans. Knowledge of the county is huge. Um, talk with different people from around the county that you work with and landowners. Go ahead next. Um, and what is what has been accomplished? That's kind of building on this. This is provide local work groups some background information. I like to have it where you can have something for them to look at. We've all been in meetings where you stare at each other and you hope somebody talks. It, you probably had that in your last breakout section. So it might be where, do you have something you can look at? Some, if it's maps, I saw that was one thing. You know, sometimes as far as for us at NRCS, if it can be harder to maybe put, if you have a few contracts that can be easier, but if you're looking at management practices and wanting to discuss, um, you know, your imprint on the county and you did nutrient management or pest management and that, that can get quite time consuming. Um, maybe there's specialists like GIS people that can really get after it, but I know most of us don't probably have that amount of time where, but your smaller stuff or your BMPs can be easier. Um, it provides them some background. These are just some example charts that I put up. Uh, one of the better local work groups I had ever been a part of. We had this, we kind of had gone through where we had been the last few years, kind of what's the trend? What are we seeing? Is that fitting into what our local work group mission or our plan, which Keith will get into, is is going towards, or are we totally missing the mark and it's going a different direction? Um, I'd like to have something that people can sit there and try to think or get this ahead of time. So next, you know, discuss this with your local work group partners. Really, this first pre-local work group is like your homework. Uh, do this with the local soil and water manager, NRCS, local partner. Do this before your scheduled local work, local work group. Uh, think about concerns, comments made by producers. I've kept a list, a running list all year because that one meeting might be a day where there's a, another meeting. Maybe the corn growers is feeding everybody. I don't know. But so there might be another meeting and they can't be there that day um, that works it. So take notes. It might not be their official meeting, but you can represent those ideas. Um, sometimes some of the best ones might come as a form of a complaint to you, but really think about it. It's their language of saying this is their resource concern or this is their issue. And it might come across as a complaint, but it's their way of saying something else. 
So take notes year round. The B, you know, open to crop consultants, equipment dealers, local agronomists. Um, had John Deere put in input or, or a local irrigation company that wants to see something different in Equip. Um, it, you never know who it could be, but just listen and keep your, keep your eyes and ears open and, and do it more of a year round process, not just a one day, kind of a cumulative in one day, but you know, and what are your local work group processes of your other members? Is it, you know, if it all wildlife, is it crop growers? What, what is, who's showing up? Next. For this year, uh, NRCS has sent out this for the conservationists to go through. Um, I would recommend not having this as a hand this out, fill this out board members and get this back to me. That's not the intent of this. I don't recommend that. Um, this isn't real hard. I think this, the intent of this is your homework pre-working with soil and water, NRCS to go through this and have this so you can bring this to your local work group and get it there. So it'd be uh, staff working on this, bringing it to the local work group and presenting this. And maybe there's something that will change, but a lot of times your major resource concern categories probably didn't change year to year. So why reinvent the wheel? Next. And that's just an example. It's in that attachment that was sent out with the bulletin on local work groups for NRCS folks. Um, it's not too hard, high, medium, low, it's not applicable. Um, kind of what is your local resource concerns for together, soil and water, NRCS. Uh, again, it's not programs, it's resource concerns. Next. So just kind of be prepared. Um, it helps to conduct a better meeting, especially if you can have them look at something, be engaged, be involved, not just sit there and, and stare at each other. You know, try to save time. Um, you know, a lot of times these, well, a lot of, uh, most of the time, these government meetings, we're paid to be there. Customers, not so much. So take into consideration to save their time, keep the meeting going. Don't go on some side tangent that might be interesting to only government people. You know, keep it, save time. Their time is important too, and we want to value that. The goal is to have better conversations and directions, and you never know where the partnerships could go from there. And I believe that that probably is it for me, I think, Lisa. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Corey. A good um, refresher for those of you who are very experienced and some um, suggestions for and uh, some good basics for those who are newer to this. So we would ask if you've got some um, examples of written conservation action plans and or ways that you do needs assessment, like Corey was showing the graph and so on. If you've got something that occurred to you that you'd like to share with your um, colleagues. But we are now moving into the um, action plan side of it. And we have Keith Klobeck to bring back um, for this section. Thank you, Donna Ray. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thank you, Corey, uh, Justin, Darren, everyone else, Ryan, Greg, for kind of leading into this. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the action plan and implementation. Uh, it's a term that may be new to you, some of you. Uh, it's in the policy. It's something that we strive for through the locally led process and local working groups that help develop this plan. And so I just want to walk through um, the details of it with you and give you kind of another high overview. So we covered this locally led conservation model in the first session, and we're coming back to it again and again throughout. Um, it's really where this gold circle starts with the districts convening the local work group with partners. I think today we've shown that that's not really the starting point. The starting point is all this pre-work, all this additional information that helps feed this. So it could be information from the last time we completed this cycle. It could be all these other plans, all this other information that you've gathered throughout the year, um, throughout your career that helps to feed this. So this is kind of the, the gold circle is really the formal bringing of this locally led local work group process together, but there's a lot of information that goes into that. Uh, as we go clockwise around the circle, it's this public participation and conservation needs assessment that was discussed today and that Corey just hit on. And then what I'm going to talk about is developing this plan, the conservation action plan. The development of it kind of goes through the next four steps on this locally led conservation model. 
And I'm gonna to briefly touch on those before we move on to um, the rest of the plan. So I know what everyone's thinking this time of the day. We just had discussion from MPCA and SWCDs, one watershed, one plan, wraps, water plans, Ryan covered a whole list of plans and everyone's, it's like, yes, another plan. We get to get together, write down another plan, conservation needs, priorities, um, goals, targeting, efforts, and everyone's probably rolling their eyes, I know. Um, but on a serious note, you know, this is an important part of the process. It's specific to uh, the conservation needs in the local work group process. And it really is helping to identify what's available and what you might be missing to succeed in your conservation efforts. Uh, it's, you know, what tools are missing from your conservation delivery toolbox? Uh, what else is out there? How can we use it? Uh, to, or, or how can we tweak it to make it better? And just like the local community and shareholders help you identify needs during the needs assessment, uh, the gathering of information, you also are gonna need partners, uh, conservation community to help inform the conservation action plan. So it's, it's an ongoing process that, that in, entails the following. So the conservation action plan should looking at priorities. It really is built off of that conservation needs assessment. It's that next step in prioritizing those specific needs and putting them down in, in a format that um, then we're targeting those top priorities. Goals, you know, that's gonna be part of any plan. We're all aware of it. You know, goals trying to be, um, you know, the SMART acronym specific, measurable, attainable, uh, realistic and time related that all is, holds true for this as well. You know, we don't need pages and pages of goals and timelines, but set measurable goals and objectives is gonna be key to following this conservation action plan through to success. And then technology and tools. You know, again, what's needed? Are there things out there that are available um, that you can modify? Are there additional items out there that maybe you have to develop um, to address your needs? Conservation Action Plan should do the following things also. So I mentioned timeline. We need a timeline with roles and responsibilities. Some of these time events may be short-term goals. Some of them may be long-term. We all know that you're not gonna develop a new conservation program overnight. You're not gonna develop new technical standards or needs, um, that, that stuff takes time. So it's nothing that's gonna happen in months, uh, weeks, months, maybe even years for measuring some of that. But that's all thing, part of the, of the plan development that could be considered if it's what you and your group determine is needed to, to meet your goals. And then partners, as with the gathering of information, partners are also key to helping identify what other programs and services are out there. You know, they're gonna have a better knowledge of what they have available and maybe some other partners they work with that we're not familiar with that may fit some of our needs. And then gaps, what's missing again from the delivery toolbox and maybe it's something that you need to develop, all part of the discussion. So back to the locally led model, once we have developed the plan, we move into the part of implementing the plan, moving on to financial and or technical assistance because some of this isn't always program driven or there's not always funds available and maybe some planning and technical assistance and then implementing the plan. So implementing the plan, this is where we're going to obtain the options in that plan. Now that we know what we need to, to complete to implement it, we're gonna go secure those services and programs. And then what is the best option? Uh, there's lots of options out there, but what's gonna be best to meet your goal? The timelines, the needs that you established. And if there's program or funding options that need to be developed, that's now is when you start developing them. During this implementation phase, phase, you identified those gaps earlier in the plan. Now you're coming back and putting that on the ground with actually uh, going and developing an, uh, a new program or securing more funding through a grant, developing new practice standards or scenarios. Back to the local ed conservation model, if we, as we implement the plan and wrap that up, it's not finished. We then need to look at the evaluating of results, measuring the performance. So it's important as with anything to track all year long and report on results. You heard from you know, the other presenters today, some methods for doing that as well that can help inform next year's decisions. Um, you know, 
were the goals achieved? And if not, why? What, what was missing? What needs to be tweaked for next year? And how can we make it better? So the discussion continues on all year long through documenting your notes, um, discussion like Corey said, keeping track of conversations all year long and additional meetings. And that way you're gonna have more information for your next local working group efforts and meetings. Once you're back to the beginning, you are now, you have completed the conservation, locally led conservation model. You've made it through the process. You are now armed with more skills and knowledge than you had previously. And you bring that forward towards your local work group next year and local conservation efforts to make them even more of a success in the future. So with that, I am done and I will turn it back over to Donna Ray. Thank you so much, Keith. And I invite Leanne Buck to give closing comments for our seminar today. Sure, uh, to build off of basically what everybody has said, I just wanna compliment our presenters, uh, the shared opportunity to be here. And again, I learned from you as individuals, your questions in the chat, uh, the ex information exchange and the items that you highlight. Uh, again, it's, it's a learning process because all of us, some of us um, in this webinar have probably been working for the district or NRCS for over 20 years. And some we know may only have been here less than a year. So we're at different places, but again, we continue to learn from all of us. What I do wanna highlight is a couple just uh, items to summarize is one group think is hard. It just purely is group think is hard and trying to learn those BMPs to help that group think process is key. Language matters. In many cases, you as resource professionals that work with customers, clients, and ultimately the public for the public benefit, you're bridging that science that you know and translating it into actionable items. And then last but not least, I guess to finalize what Keith was getting at is execution. Um, knowing what your priorities are. When we get off this phone, um, many of you will have 10, 15 different emails in your inbox and or phone calls or landowner questions or whatever it is that may come up or an agency or meetings, et cetera. And again, at the end of the day, if you aren't clear on those priorities, whatever it is, if it's for your board, it's for your watershed, if it's for the local resource process, um, we can get sidetracked rather easily. So having an understanding again of groupthink is hard, but taking that group thought process, translating it into priorities, and that'll build the trust. And obviously it makes it much easier for the execution that we all are working together to do the private lands conservation. So today I wanna to say thank you to all of you that participated and also to our course instructors and Lisa and Donna Ray and Keith, it's been tremendous uh, a privilege to work with you as we put this together. So I just wanna say thank you to all involved and more, most importantly, you as participants, thank you. <laughs>